All right, folks, thanks for joining today. My name is Eric Wilkinson with Pro Trader Strategies, and we're going to be talking about swing trades using options. And I'm here to get you folks to a place where options just make sense. And I know you probably heard of that story, give a person a fish, you feed them for a day, give, teach a person to fish, you feed them for a lifetime, right? Well, that's exactly what this course is going to be geared for, is introducing traders and investors to options. I'm sure even this old floor trader can teach the savviest of traders a thing or two. So options can be intimidating, I'm not gonna lie, folks, but I'm going to build from these simple concepts to real life examples, and by the end of all of this, you guys should have a solid understanding of options. And my goal is to get you folks to a place where options just are understood intuitively. And I think I can do that for you quickly. All right, folks. Um, you're here because you believe you're pretty smart people, and I'm sure you are. And I'm gonna show you how easy options are in this entire tutorial, all right? So no more going to the store for fish, folks. <laughs> all right, so swing trades. We're gonna be talking about the long call around this, and you guys might be thinking that I'm, I'm stating the obvious at this point, but I'll show you really how we'll look at this long call situation in detail so that you guys will, at the end of the day, have peace of mind with this trade, all right? So we're gonna to touch on potential swing trades also, which uh, we'll be coming up with our directional assumption that way and how we do that. And then we're gonna also talk about how we would use options, and in this particular case, why the long call is most appropriate, all right? So those are the real takeaways. It's not just as simple as going out there and buying the long call, but I will show you how simple it is to come up with that long call for your directional assumption trade. All right, I can't find my pin that I really want. I'll use the old school one, the broken one, <laughs> which actually might be better. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about swing trades first. And ultimately, when we're talking about sw swing trades, excuse me, we have to know the difference between a swing trade and a day trade. First off, a day trade is obviously just something that is intraday. And something that is lasting longer than two days is usually a swing trade. Now, obviously, you can do a position trade where it's a really long duration. But a swing trade is going to last probably somewhere between two days and, you know, six months or something. All right. So those are things we're going to talk about. And we are going to specifically drill down on, we need to determine a couple of things with a swing trade in and of itself, right? The trend. We have to figure out what the overall trend is. Sorry, my pen's not ready. Uh, overall trend is for this. And when I'm talking about a trend, I'm talking about, you know, you got your bullish trend. You got a sideways trend. And obviously, then you have the bearish trend, right? Then what we're going to be looking at is that, you know, the line kind of goes like something like that, where we're going to then look for, well, resistance and supports, right, in areas, okay? And then we're going to figure out that pattern within the trend. We have, a, in this case, like a bullish, this is a bullish overall trend, right? But inside of that, we've got a bearish pattern. We've got a little bear in here, right? Which we would expect to come down to at least the mid-level or possibly test the bottom end of the range. So we've got to figure out what our trend is. Then we figure out our support resistances. And then we would figure out our pattern within that, right? So in this case, we've got our resistance and our support. And then, of course, in this, we would have something where we would look at those being support and resistance areas, right? Real good drawings, Wolfman, right? All right, and the pattern within that. In this case, we've got a bearish trend with a bullish pattern inside of here, right? Where we would expect it to kind of start reverting. All right, but what obviously, what always seems to happen? All right, I've determined my bullish trend, right? I found the support and resistances because of whatever reasons happen behind here. And the market comes up and, you know, you get short here because it all of a sudden doesn't work out. It blows through that. And then you miss that opportunity. 
you come in and you get long and it kind of goes back and then, you know, it seems like it's sometimes missed opportunities. And then you watch it for a while and all it does is like hit right on those lines, right? <laughs> it doesn't blast out past your stop or whatever. So those end up happening or you will see a trend like this and it gaps down. So you're thinking, all right, well, now I need to get long here. So you're buying and then it continues back down, right? Well, the beauty in options is it will help us with regards to our strike location, right? That's what we'll talk a lot about when we're talking about options is strike location. When you're doing this with stock and you're going out there and finding these support and resistance, for once the angst is already through the roof as soon as you have that happen because you're worried about stops and all those other things that are going on. But the beauty in this is the market doesn't always even come to the support and resistance. So a lot of times it ends up being a little bit of missed opportunity. So some of you who will have a higher risk tolerance as well can take advantage of some of these times where it just doesn't quite get up and touch that line. A uh, person that has a lower risk tolerance would generally wait for that line to get touched or maybe even breached in some cases. Um, so this will add more opportunity to the overall um, patterns within that trend of the underlying you're looking for. Because, you know, normally you wouldn't just go out there and sell the stock at any given point because you might have had to pick that location, right? Or something like that. Whereas every time the underlying comes up and or near here, we can sell call, uh, sell calls way up here or, you know, buy some puts in great strike locations down here, waiting for it to revert back. So all of those things are why we would look to use options is because it gives us a little bit more opportunity, a little bit more width in and around here. But I got a little ahead of myself. I'm supposed to be talking about swing trades. I got a little bit jazzed up. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> So, you know, and this happens, and this is an example we've been talking about for quite some time is in swing trades, like IBM is a great example. You look at this red line, which happens to be, uh, I don't know, what was it? I think it was back in, uh, it's like the five year, this red is the, uh, the pandemic high and low, and the gold is the five year, uh, the gold is the five year high, which happened in 2017. And the pandemic, which is still the five-year low um, there. So just so you know where these lines are coming from. But the red lines are the ones that have been seeming to be the ones from the five years high and low, uh, the ones where we were finding the support and resistance in uh, IBM. But what happens is there's been great opportunity in this stock. This is, a, is, in my opinion, one for somebody that would be getting interested with trading swing trades, IBM is a good uh, good one to get started with as far as I'm concerned. But with that said, you know, this would have been an opportunity where, you know, a more aggressive trader like myself would get involved because I saw that candle right there, that red candle. I don't wait for it to get confirmed a lot of times. I was looking for it to go up near that support or, uh, or that resistance area in this case. Um, and revert back down. All right. So with that said, though, the market blasted off and went through that area. Well, with a short position, somebody would have been very nervous with that. With a, you know, a long put, you know, you're allowed to have a little bit more breathing room, it seems like. So sometimes when it breaks out after being in those ranges, some people would panic right, when you're doing this with the stock position and probably have lost some money and maybe even missed that opportunity. Now, again, I did take advantage of it. Uh, I did these trades small, you know, like I was talking with uh, JQ before this video, right, is doing these trades small, especially, you know, as an allocation of your overall portfolio. You know, you wanna make sure this is a very small allocation of that because this is, you know, more of a, uh, riskier type of trading um, regimen, if you will. All right, so with that said, um, I did it small here and it allowed me to keep my powder dry also I, uh, and added to it at that top. But again, I digress, we're talking about swing trades, but the beauty and options, what I wanna talk about here is when it has a tendency to kind of lose itself a little bit, you know, sometimes with these gaps, downs and ups, you know, those stops, 
aren't really giving you that much protection, folks. So especially with a stock like this, when they're gapping and things like that nature, those stops don't, don't help you out. The beauty in options is you know uh, exactly where you're in and out on these in, in regards to this strategy anyway, right? So how to swing trade, you guys have got this, right? We identify the trend, right? We identify the trend. Is it up sideways or down? You know, then we identify support and resistances on those based on what we are seeing with what's going on in that underlying, right? You identify those support and resistance. And where is the trend going in or the pattern going inside of the overall trend? Those are the things we have to figure out when we are trading these uh, swing trades, okay? And why we use options? Well, man, you already told us. Well, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it more justice, all right? Well, for one, it's better odds. And I've mentioned that a little bit because you can increase the amount of opportunities within those different patterns because we know that it's not always going to breach that support and resistance. Those are what gives us comfort in where we should see some of the momentum slowing down, right? Uh, when we reach the support, we're gonna uh, start seeing the momentum, selling momentum usually wane a little bit and it's gonna revert back to a resistance area, which is where we find uh, on the upper area, all right? I may have said that wrong one time before. I don't know, all of a sudden I'm worried I said that wrong last. All right, so uh, resistance is above, support is below, right? Um, so that means you guys can keep your powder dry when you're using options because you will have better odds to start, all right? You know the risk getting involved and you know that there's less risk in this than using a stock or an ETF position, even if you're using a stock, because we can see that these things will gap up and down. Plus with stops, we also know, you know, there's algos out there. They know pain points, all right? They know where the Fibonacci's are as well, okay? So, you know, that's why we see a lot of times these fibs will get broken and all of a sudden they come back because they're stop searching, all right? That used to be a thing on the floor also. People would kind of try and gather some momentum and look for stops when they knew it was getting at certain levels. All right, that's a thing, believe it. All right, and if you don't have a stop, you don't have to worry about that. You're in this option strategy that you have time to be right. You can let all that noise uh, be put in the background. You don't have to worry about it because you know those risks. All right, so with that being said, talking about this trade, I'm not necessarily sure why I threw this up, but we know that, I think this is where I got ahead of myself. We knew where the support and resistances were, all right? A lot of times you would miss opportunities, uh, you know, on this quick move here uh, and this quick move here, right? You know, it start consolidating or whatever. Uh, for the upside, you know, there are times where you might have missed a real quick opportunity. Now, you probably would have gotten involved in here. Uh, I'm not saying that, but, you know, it doesn't always touch is what I'm getting at. And those would be missed opportunities, right? Because the idea is not only finding this move here, right? All of those things, but also know, you know, last time I didn't quite do it justice, but the idea is to get out at the mid range between these two lines here, okay? Uh, in a trade with, say for instance, IBM, that was like a neutral trade. Now I'm not saying this is what we're setting up for the long call, I'm giving an idea of about swing trades right now. But the idea is you would get out at the mid level. Now this just happens to be the point of control, which uh, helps out with a trade like this to the downside. But having said that, I want to talk about the support resistances. Using options will allow you to stay in these trades a little bit longer when it breaks through those. And we were using these as examples as well. Now. You know, in something like SPY, we found the support and resistance support being here, right? And here, and then resistance is being up in this level. But we know when we put these in here, it doesn't always reach that level. Somebody might say you have the lines wrong. I don't, these are good, good lines to follow, but it doesn't always reach. So you would have missed out on a lot of opportunities 
to fit, take advantage of these little swing trades inside of the overall bigger trend, all right? Less risk, you know, that would have been a long time waiting for those opportunities. With options, we can take advantage more often uh, by getting involved a little bit earlier, but you're gonna be getting much better strike location. Now, I was looking at this for an example for a long call, right? Why? Well, we have a bit of a pattern here going, right? We've got probably what would be considered a now bearish pattern, in, in, or a, sorry, a bearish trend. And inside of this bearish trend, right, I've got a up pattern here. Now, most people would have to wait for a level down and around here, but I got in because of that candle right there. And generally speaking, uh, you know, you get a green candle or a red candle that looks like this at the bottom of a move. And then I can't change my pen right now, but um, you get a green candle. Actually, I could go to a pretend green candle. I might be able to even change the color, ink color. There we go, figured it out. And then you get a green candle like this. That is the confirmation of a reversal or a, a, a move to the upside, okay? So uh, that's why I got involved in this because of that confirmation of that move. Now, keep in mind, this candle did look a lot better before I squashed it all uh, to fit in this on a Zoom. But um, anyway, that's why I went for it is with this confirmation right there on that trade. And I touched my screen there. So anyway, uh, I got way ahead of myself there. So we did that, yep, all right. Oh, I erased it and it popped. All right, so what are the options, all right? Options give the call buyer has the right but not the obligation to buy that stock, all right? So what that means is you would be able to buy the stock at the strike that you purchased, all right? So if in this case, uh, I was looking at Snap making a move and I was buying the 60 calls when it is trading at around uh, $54, all right? I think I got it when it was around 53.50 or something. But with that said, I bought the 60 calls. That means it gives me the opportunity to buy Snap at 60. Now, I don't have to do that, right? So I have the right but not the obligation to buy it at 60. Now, if it goes up to 70, then I might, you know, fancy that opportunity. At this point, I want to take advantage of a trade on a move, on a swing type trade. So with that said, buying the 60 calls, I have really good uh, strike location on this. Plus, it lines up with this bit of a resistance area. So I would say that that would be where I am going to look to get out when it reaches that resistance. We can do the swing trade the same way that way with these Fibonacci's. It bounced off of this Fib confirmation. I expect it to go, you know, somewhere up there. You know, that's the 200, or sorry, that's a 50-day simple moving average or uh, the Fib there. I don't remember exactly what Fibonacci that was, though. Right offhand. So it gives you the right but not the obligation to do that. Now, the seller has the obligation to deliver that stock. So if I sell a call and somebody calls those stock away from me, and I don't own those stock, well, now you are actually short stock and you're gonna have to put up borrowing uh, cost, margin, all kinds of things. There's uh, borrowing fees is what I meant to say. Um, and you're gonna have to borrow the stock. Hopefully there's stock to be borrowed, otherwise it creates all kinds of issues. Uh, so stay away from the ever exercise, just stay away from the exercise process of options for the most part, folks. It doesn't pay to exercise options and it definitely doesn't pay to get exercised on options usually. It's better to flush out and get out of the trade and you know then go out there and do it. If I want to, in some regards, buy the stock, right? I'm buying a call in this case and I want to offset that by exercising my right but not my obligation to buy that or take that stock away from that person at the strike price. Yes, I can do that. But keep in mind, you're leaving money on the table. And I'm not going to dig into that. I've done that in other webinars, so please check those out. But you're you're getting you're just it's just another whole can of worms. You're going to be leaving money on the table. Just know that. All right. Uh, 
uh, the put buyer has the right but not the obligation to sell the stock. So if I buy a put, that means that if I can buy a put and the underlying goes down, right, I get the obligation to sell that, or I can have that right to sell up above where it currently is. That's a huge benefit, right, to sell a stock well above where something is currently trading. Well, yes, there is a huge benefit in that. Again, don't take your uh, right to do that. Just offset the put, sell the stock uh, in the open market. It will save you money because you'll be leaving money on the table. And the put buyer has the obligation to take delivery of that stock, meaning I have to own it at that strike level, right? If I uh, have that stock put to me, all right? Called away and put to you, all right? Is the way to think about those uh, on the sell side. On the call side, we used to teach newer people around options. Is it call up? You call up somebody? Or you put, you put down, you put somebody down, or the, as in the case of, right, the Romans, you put them down, right? So put down. This is the arb for put, call, call up, put down, right? Good enough? We're good with that? <laughs> All right. So now some of you guys might be thinking it's obvious. Again, we have a bullish assumption. It's a no-brainer. We are doing the long call. No, that's not true. What we need to do now is really look at how we buy things, right? Do you like to buy things when they're super expensive? I like to buy them when they're super cheap, to be honest. And, you know, when you have a bullish assumption, uh, we don't always know if those options are cheap or expensive, right? That's something we have to determine immediately, if not sooner than we do anything else with options. We've already determined our trend pattern all of those things, support resistances for the swing trade. Now we're looking at that underlying that we found this opportunity in to use options, all right? And the first thing we know is we're looking at these options. We have to know implied volatility, all right? So we need to look at the option montage for that to determine whether their options are expensive or are they cheap. So the option montage, what I'm talking about is when you go over to the page, what has this thing that looks like you're flying a 747 or something, right? Well, I, I do videos on streamlining them, what you're looking at here. But to keep things simple here as well, we're looking at Snap trading at $54 when I took this snapshot or snap shot. All right. And we're looking at Vega. All Vega is, folks, is implied volatility. All right. And you're going to hear this a lot from me if you ever, you know, follow my courses. Implied volatility is the most important thing to look at when you are trading options. It tells you if it is expensive or cheap. Now, not just this number, you know, we're going to look at these numbers all here, but what I'm saying is that number means something. It's telling us what the premiums are right now based on that number. What we need to know is where Snapchat's Implied volatility is normal because if it's really high right now, that would indicate that premiums are very expensive because volatility fluctuates like just like our swing trade does. And what it has a tendency to do is find those support and resistances as well. All right. So we can determine when they are cheap and when they are expensive based on that same methodology, that same thought process. I guess one of the dogs wants to learn how to trade options. Based on all of those things, we can correlate these all in one simple felled swoop, to be honest. All right. Oh, one other thing, real quick, while I've got this up. Another thing with this implied volatility is when we're looking at this, we want to make sure when we found this opportunity and we're looking now to trade options around it, that there is a lot of volume and open interest in and around this underlying we're trading, all right? So here's a quick hack for that. If it's a stock that is less than $100, all right? So our stock is less than $100. We have to have our bid offer in the option montage to be less than or equal to 10 cents Y, all right? And what I mean by that is we look at the spot month. It's the one that is closest to expiration. 
usually I like to say inside of 35, right around 35 days to expiration is when there is the most time and volume going on in that underlying inside of that. All right. So that's, that's going to work with this April contract. All right. And we want to look at this column right here between the two. And we can see between the two, it is fitting that rule of being less than or equal to 10 cents wide on a stock that's less than $100, right? All right, now on a stock that's over $100 is really simple. Just remember one, two, three, you move your decimal point three places to the left. So if it's a $300 stock, then it would be less than or equal to 30 cents, okay? That makes sense, all right? You know, if it was a $1,300 stock, then what is it? Less than or equal to $1.30, okay? Pretty simple. Sorry, I wanted to get that out of the way before we got on. All right, so this was a snapshot of Snap yesterday. And, you know, based on it holding support, I'm sorry, I keep touching the tab thing on the side there. Um, we found support, we're looking for it to move to the upside. Now here is that implied volatility that we need to make sure we are keeping track of it. And I put this down in my charts because it is the, utmost importance in determining pricing in the options because like i said right here um let me get back to my red pen because i think you can see that a little bit better on the ink color uh red so we're looking down here where implied volatility is currently all right and what we want to do is look at these areas of the highs and the lows because we can see that if i stretch this out for the full year, you would see that actually that high is uh, concurrent with another one or in line with another one, tweezer top in a, well, in a way. So we take that line and then we also, right, need to know where kind of the middle of the road is uh, because that's 50-50. So the idea is when it's at the extreme upper levels, premiums are expensive. When it's down at these levels, premiums are cheap below that hash line, right? So what we could say is that dot is 116, all right, or 116% one, uh, or usually on the thing it'll have a dot there, but I'm just gonna make it all whole numbers. Uh, the, the bottom line here on the low is around 50 and we're gonna call this one 73 over here, 73, okay? That's, that's what we would be determining if we pulled the, the lines up and and followed those across kind of like this in a sense. So we said 116, uh, 50 down here and 73, I think I said. All right, so, well, one thing we could do is just set it up like this where you kind of draw your line on there and figure it out. Basically, this is the buy zone and this is the sell zone of options. Meaning these are expensive up here, obviously. Even that's expensive and these are super cheap, right? So a way to figure this out for those people who are really uh, wanting to dig into the, the numbers, you basically, you take the current implied volatility minus the low volatility, all right? You take that sum and divide it by the high implied volatility minus the low, all right? And sorry, minus. Uh, basically, you're just trying to figure out where the current is right here. This dot is in relation to those highs and lows that you've kind of figured out. Now, so you can ballpark it, or you can really dig into these details and do all the math for it, like 73 minus 50 over the 116 minus the uh, low, which is 50. So we got 23 over uh, 66. 23 over 66, that's gonna be 35%-ish, 34.8. All right, so again, when we're looking at these like little hacks that we're trying to streamline our process to find out what option strategy or how we're gonna trade these options, one of those hacks I did was talked about making sure we understand that we're trading an option that is option tradable. If, for lack of a better phrase, but that's important. No, there's a lot of volume and open interest in there. We don't want to get involved 
and trying to figure out the option pricing. Let everybody at free market price discovery take care of that, right? But if it's greater than 50, when we do this math, 50%, you know, that's the sell. And if it's less than 50, we're looking to buy, all right? In different videos, we'll talk about how we can limit some of the risks and stuff like that. But right now, I'm considering this low premium. Yes, it could go lower, but it's pretty low, so they're pretty cheap. So if options are going to be, if we're trying to determine if these options specifically are cheap or expensive, we know that they're cheap, so we're going to look to buy those options, right? So, um, so when you're spotting that option strategy, we need to be good stewards of our capital, folks. Remember, you have to try and think about that thief in the night as well. When we're buying something, we are purchasing something we hope to retain value. We have to think about something that is a constant with options, and that is theta. And theta is the thief in the night. All right. I already said volatility was the most important. Well, theta is pretty important too, because it is the thief. It constantly comes in and picks away or erodes that, that money or that premium that we saw. You can kind of think about it as a, a, a banana, if you will. You know, it seems like a banana when you first buy it. It, it doesn't get ripe super fast. It takes a while. But then once it gets to kind of like that yellow, it seems to go brown like overnight, right? So that's kind of like what Theta does is it starts out really quietly kind of ripening, if you will. And it will get really aggressive towards the expiration of these options. And as a matter of fact, remember I talked about that wheelhouse of 35 days to expiration. If you follow, like I said, my courses, we'll talk a lot about this number uh, on days to expiration because inside of this area is where theta really gets aggressive. And I'm gonna show you guys this in the option montage, but you can see inside of there, it's really aggressive and further out in time, it even levels out a little bit more here. So out here is how you can limit that theta. This is the ripe banana, right? This is where you buy it. And this is where you sell that banana, right? Okay. I just literally came up with that analogy, I think. So I don't know if it works very well. <laughs> so buy zone outside at 70-ish days to expiration and inside of 35 days to expiration is that sell zone, right? Because if you're selling something, you would want it to decay quickly, right? I want it to get, if I sold it, I want it gone, right? If I buy it, I want it to hold on. So I want to buy it when it's um, not completely ripe, I guess with that analogy, if I'm gonna stick with it, all right? So in the option montage, we've got theta, and I cut it off. So this is the column for theta for the puts and the column for theta for the calls when we're looking at this option montage for a snack, right? So we can see it's always negative. Well, look at this, inside this 15 days to expiration, we can see that theta is happening at about eight cents a night to our premiums, all right? And we have to remember there's an option contract multiplier because with options, every option is equivalent to 100 of the underlying folks. So it's like going out there and if I were gonna buy a call, it's like buying 100 uh, snap, all right? So if I buy a one lot in the options, I have to multiply my premiums by 100 or the, uh, you know, these Greeks in order to determine that. But eight cents would be eight dollars a night inside of 15 days to expiration so that's pretty that's pretty uh, aggressive right now you go out here and you can see that why is uh with 50 days to expiration it's about five cents right on the calls and on the puts or sorry on the calls about 78 days outside that 70 days right you can see that it's only about four cents so basically you moved uh, 28 days this way and we only lost one extra penny between these two, right? Between the, so you can kind of start getting those minds thinking back to, to this where I said, you know, the buy zone, 
you know, we're talking going from here to, you know, right around here, right? Versus inside of here going into here. Why these look the way that they do. Sorry, I went to the wrong one. I'm gonna go to this one. Are we going there? I guess I'm giving it a fit for some reason. It doesn't want to give my uh, drawings back up here. So again, eight cents, there we go. Eight cents, five cents, four cents. So we're only losing, you know, four, uh, one penny or one dollar on these 30 days. But basically, if you look between, you know, if you were to get involved in this option contract in the May, what would happen in the next few days is it's going to go from five cents to probably seven, eight cents rather quickly. So, you know, even the 50 day, we don't want to get involved in that or that, right? I would rather be in look if I'm buying something in between these two for my swing trade. I'm only losing a dollar then versus that, you know, four dollars, three dollars, three to four dollars, right? A night. Okay. Sounds like you love bananas. I do like bananas. You know what? I, my favorite is peanut butter, banana, and honey. Now that will change your life. All right. So, so we got to be aware of those, those things here in regards to those two Greeks, right? We need to know implied volatility, just where it is for this underlying so we can know if the premiums are expensive or if they're cheap, right? And then we need to also be good stewards of our capital. If we are buying something, we wanna retain that value. Yes, it is gonna cost you a little bit more to go out here in time, uh, but not much, right? Not much really. In, in respect of how much I'm losing per night up in here to the next few days. So I wanna make sure I take advantage of that. So we know the buy zone, we know the sell zone of this. We're thinking we have a couple of things going on with our strategy, right? We have uh, a bullish, we have a bearish pattern, or sorry, bearish trend with a bullish pattern in there. We also uh, want to, Find out about the implied volatility. We determine that's pretty cheap or pretty low, which means these premiums are all going to be pretty cheap. I don't have to worry about it anymore. I don't have to really worry about these numbers specifically. I just need to know where they are in relation to that high and low, that range, our support and resistance, right? And we need to limit that theta decay, which is getting further out in time. So when we're looking at the long call, we need to know our strikes, right? Well, where are we going to look at it? Well, this is the standard deviation curve. If you're going out there and buying a stock, for instance, we are looking at, you know, time zero. That is the price. Whatever that price is, is the zero. And then these are the probabilities of a move. It's basically, you know, 50% this way and 50% this way from the time of purchase. Now we believe when we're trading swing trades that we're increasing those probabilities a hair, right? We're turning the tables a little bit because we found some momentum shift and that can help us turn the probabilities in, their, in our favor. This is mwah, turning the table reverse when you're using options because you can get the probabilities in your favor even more. You know, you have risk, big time risk to the downside when you're doing a stop, right? We talk about gap stops, you know, the next day stop gets opened up and it just goes to the market and who knows where it's getting filled. The options, you know where your stop is. It's that strike with the long call. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit further. So, you know, if you're really aggressive, I, you know, I talk about somewhere about the 45 Delta, all right? Um, or, you know, the 36 delta is usually where I like to look at it. And you're saying, hey, Wolfman, you're talking about standard deviations when and deltas. Yes, they're basically one of the same, folks. When we're talking about a standard deviation curve, these are probabilities of something happening, right? When we're talking about a standard devi deviation curve, it's a probability of something happening. And if I was looking at a one standard deviation move, right? That is basically a, oh, sorry, folks, that's a 16 delta. 
on the one standard deviation move. I'm looking at the 36 delta, which is a half a standard deviation move. Why didn't you guys blow me up? Who do, who's not following the standard deviations? Sorry, folks. Uh, it's actually about a 16 delta and 34 delta. But I like to look at between the 45 and the 36 deltas, which kind of puts me within this little range here. Okay. So uh, I'm trying to limit my risk and increase my probabilities of success. Because when I get in there, I know my risk is this purchase of the long call. I know I'm buying it cheap. Um, so I've limited those risks. Now I want to look at those strikes. I want a pretty good probability of my strikes getting clipped. All right. I want pretty good probability that the underlying is going to move a little bit higher here. All right. And clip my long call. That's my idea. I don't always go straight to that long call because you really only have a 50 50 chance of this happening. Right. You know, yeah, I have a high probability of my strike going in the money and becoming intrinsically valuable all of those things everybody talks about well yes there is that but also keep in mind when i'm buying that option that's at around that 36 delta it's much cheaper i'm risking a lot less and ultimately if my strike gets hit which is probably where you would be looking to get out of a swing trade anyway that risk reward your return on investment is going to be much better with this uh 36 delta all right. Yes, you're, it's going to feel a lot better when you got that 45 or 50 delta. A lot of people talk about, but keep in mind, you're doing it on a swing trade, and where my strike location is is most likely where you're looking to get out of your trade anyway. So, uh, you know, a lot of people will talk about delta. It does tell you the rate of change in that options premium. For every dollar move higher, our premium is going to move higher by our long call will move higher by that. Uh, that that coefficient, that number in delta, right? Underlying moves up by a dollar. You know, in my case, I'm talking about a 36 delta, right? My premium in that strike would increase by 36 cents. Okay, pretty simple. But I look at it as data. On the floor, we used to call it data. And that's because it's going to give us the odds. The odds of my underlying or my strike being in the money i said i like a 36 delta that's a 36 percent probability of being in the money or you know getting touched is what we or or getting hit being in the money at expiration all right that's at expiration 36. now on the floor we would say two times the delta is the probability of the underlying hidden. So let's say, for instance, XYZ is here. My 36 delta is here, you know, whatever strike that is. In this case, I'm talking about a 60 call, right? I think I was. Um, may let a cat out of the bag. But uh, the probability of this coming up and trading at $60 is two times the delta. So in this case, that would be what, 72% uh, probability. So it doesn't always have, Delta tells you the probability of being in the money at expiration. Some people will tell you that. On the floor though, uh, a trader hack is two times that Delta is that you're gonna get hit. Whoa. <laughs> if you had the camera up, that was a great one. I almost got whacked in the face. <laughs> All right, so. Delta tells us that probability of being in the money. So the at the monies, I would say, is closer to that 47 delta. Me, I'm going for that out of the money. That's that 36 delta that we're going to look to get long because we know we are buying it cheap. We've already determined that. And like I said, I'm not trying to pump and dump snap, you guys. I'm not trying to do this Reddit thing. But there, there's times where, with especially with the swing trades, I want to be, you know, I see you will. I see you will. I'll get to it in a second. That's something I'm going to have to read. Um, but so I did put this trade on. Well, I mean, I, I put on this synthetic or hypothetical trade yesterday, right? So 
And it was when it was a 36 Delta. So I talked about this. I put it on when it was about 50 cents lower than this yesterday. And today, I took all these snapshots yesterday. I'm so annoyed. And woke up today and it was, they were all for some reason scrambled and I couldn't use them. So I had to go to today and do those screenshots because I wanted to do the progression. Uh, anyway, so I uh, am looking at those, that 60 call because it was the 36 Delta. Now it's moved a little bit higher. It's a 41 Delta, but it's still within that range. Um, and I got, I would look to get way out in time outside that 70 some odd days, the expiration. I'm limiting that theta decay, right? Now, when do we, uh, so wait, actually I got, almost got ahead of myself again. Let me make sure I cover my notes there. Um, so obviously with this, I'm not gonna have to worry about making the right choices, right? I've gone through the logical thing to do, right? If we look at these options and we break it down like this, it's just logical, right? That's why I said you guys are gonna understand this stuff intuitively. You know, when you break it down, I believe in this process. We don't have to worry about our premiums. You know, sometimes people worry about, well, why did I make or lose money? Well, I got the directional move, right? Well, it's probably due to that volatility. They bought it when volatility was too high, all right? They could get that directional move right, and if that volatility came out, they could lose money. So we know that we bought it cheap. Uh, it doesn't mean we bought it the cheapest it's ever been, but we know we bought it cheap, all right? We know our odds of our strategy, right? We know we re uh, our risk on this is the premium we paid, right? Anytime you're buying an option, you have the right but not the obligation. So you know your risk is the premium. And we know we're limiting our risk on this trade because for one, you're gonna probably risk a lot more than $400, like. Here, in this case, I bought or we uh, hypothetically bought the June 60 calls for $3.55. So with that, the risk is $355 on this trade. If you bought SNAP outright in the markets, your risk is to zero. Now, if you had a stop in there, yeah, you, that's where your risk is if it doesn't gap down, right? If it gaps down with an option, you don't have to worry about it. You can keep your powder dry. So with all of that said, when do we get out of this trade? For me, I'm gonna be looking for my strike to get touched. If I get up there to that 60, for one, I got great strike location with this strategy because that 60 call, I kind of mentioned it in one of those, is a pit. So the market is gonna, uh, find a resistance there that when it hits that, I'm going to look to get out. Um, so we don't need to do the calculation for implied volatility of an underlying. Thus, think or swim to show you what the ID is on the option bubble uh, or show us if it's expensive or cheap. You can use that on think or swim and, uh, and will I'll show you that and everybody else on there. The reason why I don't always like to use it, I do have it in my watch list, okay? I'm not gonna lie, I, I keep an eye on it. But it's a little bit waggy right now because we've had this pandemic, right? And with the pandemic, it's still within our charts where Thinkorswim is calculating those highs. Now, I don't think that we're gonna see those highs. I think that's a black swan event. The black swan event rarely ever happens. As a matter of fact, last time we saw that kind of volatility from the pandemic was like, in, uh, uh, I think it was 1980, what was it, 1984 or whatever. So, um, and then before that, 1929. Um, so those kind of events probably aren't gonna happen. It's still calculating that as if it is. So I like to, like that's another reason why I kind of shortened my chart there was to take that out of the map. Does that make sense, Will? And everybody else, how I explained that? All right, so, you know, one thing we used to say is when you're looking at this uh, type of strategy, okay, for a swing type trade, and I'm picking that 36 delta, all right, when that short strike gets breached, that's where we would look to get out on the floor. We knew that we had beaten the probability. My probabilities of being in the money at expiration is only 36%. The probabilities of getting clipped, is two times that, 72%.
what do you want? Right? You're, you're going to have a nice, beautiful profit once that happens. So that's when I look to get, get out of these uh, long calls at that 36 delta, all right? If you're buying it around that uh, 50 delta, I would say when your uh, premium is increased by 50%, that would probably be where I would get out. So you paid $5, you're getting out at 750, right? Um, the other, if on the floor, we used to call the guys that would look for their prices to double to be uh, matadors because they were crazy. <laughs> So uh, those are the different, those would, if you can relate those to your risk parameters, then that, that's probably what I would, lower risk parameter is probably the one where I talk about, you're getting out and getting clipped as soon as that, sh that uh, long call gets touched or your strike gets breached, all right? Those are in and out trades on the swing trade, all right? So that's where I'm gonna be looking at, oh, and my, uh, I keep saying short strike for some reason, but when my long call, I'm going to write it down so that I'm clear, uh, gets breached, right? That would be my, uh, on the downside, when do we get out on the downside? Well, for me, I, I hold solace. I'm going to let this kind of play out. I, I talked about it with the long put from the IBM. We haven't gotten into those details for that trade yet uh but with that being said you know it gave me room to you know keep my powder dry and let it come back all right whereas if you got those stops and all that stuff then you, you're looking to get out too quickly especially in this day and age where it seems like the algos like to breach those more often than we used to probably see and i've got quite a bit of trading under my belt all right so anyway you guys that's it for it. Uh, there's no more questions. If you do have more questions, I'm going to make sure uh, I answer them. Will, I still see you. I'm going to go back to that. So stick around for the end of that. But if you guys, this is our options lab. You guys should take advantage of this because I do talk about all of my trades in these daily market commentaries, okay? Where, when, where, and why I'm putting them on. I'm talking about chart setups and all of those things. So you get that information right off the bat as soon as i'm doing it also you get unlimited access to me uh i'm going to be your mentor you know i'm going to keep you mechanical so you guys reach out to me you have any questions comments or anything else i will make sure i uh have you clear a concept before moving on and if it means i have to, i'm going to give you a phone call because i i don't want to type it all out then i will absolutely do that for you uh so take advantage of that um, and you get access to all my entire catalog of all of the uh, trades I've done. So uh, earnings are right around the corner. It would be a good opportunity to get the earnings under your belt because you want to read those or watch those. And then we're going to be hitting earnings just around the corner. As a matter of fact, IBM's got earnings coming up pretty soon. And it's probably a sell, <laughs> even though I'm long uh, for the most part. But, but, ah. Watch the daily market commentaries. You can see all the stuff I got going on in IBM. Uh, I'm probably actually short IBM with everything I've got going on. All right. So that being said, thank you guys all. Later webinars, I'll drill down on different option components, when and where I find those. Hey, you don't have to type this into your link if you guys are sticking around. I threw it over there in the chat window. There's a quick hot link to this. Also, if you have any questions, comments, or anything else, you can reach out to us at Trading Pro Trader Strategies. If you're taking anything away from this, you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. It really does help. I mean, you guys aren't, uh, there's no quota for limited on how many thumbs ups you can throw. So give me a thumbs up if you would. And if you have any questions, comments, throw it down there at the bottom. I'll be sure to reply to everybody. I, like I said, want to make sure uh, everybody's clear a concept and um, before moving on with anything. All right. So without, Further ado, I'll go back to this and talk to Will about this thing. If anybody else has any questions, or feel free to reach out. So, think or swim, option montage. Oh, it's buried. Come on, can't get a hold of it. All right, so what is this Apple? Um, option montage, so what we are talking about here with uh, the option montage, and we wanna see this, 
today's option statistics, dropping it down. So the current implied volatility percent for Apple on thinkorswim toss uh, is given to you right here. Also, um, not sure why my, I might have to check my script. My computer had, I had to redo everything. For some reason, I didn't remember the uh, last time I shut it down. So uh, I threw in the new script in there and I don't know if that's, it must be calculating off somehow. But I do have the script to throw over there in the watch list if you want it. That was a good sales strategy. Uh, but uh, it, it is going to include though, this massive spike from basically those March uh, lows, April lows now here, which is a little bit higher than those March 23rd lows that we saw, but that volatility is still extremely elevated taking into that calculation. Now, for me, I would say that this is probably a better representation of where volatility is. I've talked about, I think we're gonna see volatility elevated probably for the remainder of 2021. Um, and, you know, we're seeing the BICs go back into the teens. So that might be uh, the new paradigm also, where the 20s was the new BIX teens. Usually you would say BICs getting up into the higher teens and 20s was very high volatility. Uh, that's been pretty low volatility lately for the BICs. Um, so we'll have to keep an eye on those things because we do have to take everything into account. And that's why I, with my trade, uh, wanted to discount some of that with uh, SNAP. And uh, so, you know, SNAP though does have this being the high. So that does need to be taken into account. It's not hard enough. This, like where I had it zipped in here, right? Uh, I counted that one as 116, I think. Um, and the reason why I did is because I saw it had happened once right before. Got it. So, but that's why I like to to know that you know the other thing I would do is just go like this. You know, you can ballpark it too. So it doesn't. It's a hack, right? To ballpark it, and that's why I would do it. I would kind of go, all right, right there. Yep, fifty to seventy and seventy to one sixteen. Well, I know I'm pretty low. The link has no information. Oh, it takes you to the, uh, takes you to the cart. It takes you to buy, sorry. Um, I don't have the perfect link, but that takes you to the cart to get signed up. And what does it give you? It, uh, Greg, it, it's given you, I mean, I'm talking hundreds and hundreds of hours of content. Like you, if you're a beginner trader, Craig, or Greg, Sorry, uh, Greg, if you're a beginner trader, you could go to the uh, introduction to options. You could go to the beginner's uh, trading guide where I really go and break those things down from a remedial. Uh, and then there's some for, you know, this is for advanced traders, for high risk trades, okay? So it basically, you go in there, you get everything. It's everything. My email, you. You get that, All right? All right, thanks guys. That's all I got for you if there's no more questions.